so much to talk about, so much good stuff here. Why don't, you know, what I want to do is, is start with a sort of broader kind of picture right now in the state of free speech. I'm just going to go over something in the past day. This is the past day. Just looking through Google News, flipping through. Um, Nabil Rajib in Bahrain, his detention has been, been kept on for another couple of weeks for a tweet. Um, now, continuing on, on the tweet front, on, in your country, some sort of half-witted fascist in Liverpool, you know, hideous stuff, knuckle-dragging stuff, but of course we have to defend people who have knuckle-dragging views, uh, arrested for a tweet, same thing, anti-Semitic tweet. Um, Fleming and I were talking about this the other day. In Sweden, an artist, a street artist named Dan Park uh, was sentenced to six months in jail for uh, racist artwork. Now, we don't know, I think he's sort of being ironic in this. Incitement to racial hatred, yeah. But yeah, yeah, had small folk group, this incitement to ra racial hatred. Sentenced to six months in jail, and two of these examples are in Europe. You know, this, you know, so what's going on? Where are we? I mean, anybody can jump in here and start, because it looks pretty grim from where I sit. Uh, well, I think it has to do with several things, and, and one of the things that I spoke about in my, in my talk was the growing diversity of, uh, of all European societies with immigration. And it seems that, that, that the, the, the gut reaction of a lot of gov governments is that we had to silence offensive speech in order to keep the social peace. So that's one point, but I think there is a more fundamental thing that has to do with the erosion of the distinction between words and deeds. Uh, there is a growing trend that, uh, that, that people, even uh, human rights advocacy group, defend outlawing defensive speech and treating it as almost as offensive as violent actions. Just to give you one example, in, 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 in Moscow a few years ago there was an exhibition called Religion Be Careful, and it was a bit mostly attacking uh, uh, Christianity. And it was, uh, it was uh, destroyed by some offended Orthodox uh, Christians. The police showed up and arrested the perpetrators. And you would think, end of case. Then within two weeks, all the criminals were released, and the museum and the curator were indicted with incitement to religious hatred, and they were convicted in two years. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a, the logical consequence when you are not making a clear distinction between saying something as offensive and committing a violent crime. Then you cannot uh, distinguish uh, uh, the perpetrator of a crime and its, uh, its victim. And I think that is going on all over the place, and in a way it brings us back to the time before the Enlightenment, where the church in Europe was perceiving insult to uh, you know, its belief, uh, its foundation, as a physical attack on the church, and therefore you had to burn on the stake all these heretics. And today, not knowing that is the case, there is this link, in fact, we are, revive, we are reviving a tradition that goes back uh, several hundred years, uh, although I don't want to make an exact equation, but I think the trend is clear. That deserves, deserves your applause. Anyone else? I mean, I find it interesting that I go all over the world, and I go to somewhere like Egypt or Equatorial Guinea, and people are risking their lives and their freedom for things which we in the West now take so easily for granted, which is for freedom and freedom to say what you want and to, to, to say, go against the grain. And I think we see it with the way there's such an anti-politics mood in, in the West, uh, whereby people are wanting very simplistic solutions and they're disenchanted with the conventional political process. Some of that is understandable given events of recent years. But also there's a forgetting actually how good the societies are in the West and how free they are. Um, and you see it also with free speech. And I think one of the downsides, I'm a big fan of social media, um, not just thanks to Mr. Kagami, who gained me 1,500 <laughs> followers, but... Um, uh, I'm a big fan of it because I think it is a democratizing tool and I think that what's happening in the media for, for someone of my age who's very old school in it, writing for a newspaper, it's quite scary seeing that newspapers declining and the new media building up. But actually it's a great democratizing pool, uh, a tool and there's change happening and I'm, I think it's fantastic to see that. But the downside is that there's a sort of bovine type tendency of opinion and if someone steps out of line, the whole of the Twitter sphere yeah. or Facebook crashes right, down yeah. on them. And I think that stops people doing it. I know when I take controversial issues on, say, aid or the National Health Service in the UK, mm -hmm. I get viciously attacked from some of the most unlikely people. And, you know, if you're taking a really controversial position, it's hideous and it's scary and it's terrifying. 
And I think that's part and parcel of what we're seeing, where the, whereby people forget how precious free speech is. But, I mean, we, we talk about, you know, these sort of brutal attacks. We have two people on this panel whose lives were threatened for, for, you know, standing up for free speech. But if we take it down to that level, the level of, you know, something like bullying, I mean, we have this in the UK quite frequently. People say things that are rude and deeply offensive. And now there, there's, there's percolating up this idea that we should prosecute people for, you know, bullying online, bullying on Twitter. I mean, it, I, I don't see, there's, I can't think of many countries, I mean, the US is almost an exception, um, that have, you know, free speech totally. That are, there's always some sort of limits on speech, are there not? But you have to have some limits on free yeah. speech. Do Which would be, be what? The difficulty is where you draw those limits. Yeah. Um, and whether we were talking earlier about whether you should have uh, limits on hate speech and whether actually by having limits on hate speech you prevent people expressing it, and therefore you prevent people being able to challenge those people who are expressing it, mm -hmm. and actually whether it's a good or a bad thing. And I think as societies, what we have to do is fumble our way to try and find an equilibrium that does protect the right to be offensive and the right to free speech, while also, particularly in the new age, the new digital age, uh, allows people to have some form of protection. There has to be some control, I think, but maybe others disagree. Yeah, but I, I, I would say that, uh, I mean, on the books, United States has the, the freest uh, regime of free speech in the world. They have the First Amendment. But at the same time, uh, um, the civil society in the United States is more rigid than uh, in, in Europe. And you have speech codes on campuses and companies. And so, so in many, while in Europe we have more limitations on speech on the legal level, you have more social limitations on speech in the uh, United States. But if you, uh, I mean, in, in, in Europe, the argument for banning hate speech is a specific reading of the events that led up to the Second World War and the Holocaust, that, that, uh, that uh, Nazi hate speech paved the way for the destroying of uh, the Jews in Europe. But what we forget, in fact, was that in Weimar, Germany, you had hate speech laws on the books, and, and Josef Goebbels, uh, the propaganda minister of uh, Hitler, was in fact uh, convicted uh, several times for hate speech against the uh, vice police director of Berlin, Bernard Weiss, who was uh, Jewish. But in the U.S., you have had um, you have had uh, a growing growing room for freedom of expression throughout the 20th century through the Supreme Court's interpretation of the First Amendment. But at the same time, the United States throughout the 20th century has become less racist. You had the Civil Rights Movement, you had the first uh, uh, black uh, Secretary of State, now you have the first black president. Uh, and that is counterintuitive to the, to the European exper uh, uh, um, experience where we believe that if you give too much freedom of expression, uh, it will lead to more uh, racist or um, uh, uh, hate-based behavior. I, I, I disagree strongly with that, uh, with, with that point of view. Well, I mean, let's talk about that in a larger context, whether that's, that's in the US, and I don't know if this is the case in Sri Lanka, and we'll find out uh, now, is that you know, the idea of using history as a cudgel, I mean, you, you mentioned it too. In, in Rwanda, the use of uh, you know, genocide uh, by Paul Kagame to, to beat his enemies with and curtail speech. Talked briefly about Holocaust in Ireland, we talked about this the other day, and you know, when the cartoons came out, every person that, that you know, argued against them to me said, well, hey, come on, you know, in Europe, you can't deny the Holocaust. This is this shibboleth, you cannot, attack this, but yet you can attack our profit. And there was a moment, and I actually wrote a column about this, where I said, you know, you have a bit of a point there. And the Red Army, of course, and a lot of countries seem, seem to have, is that, is that actually the case in, in Sri Lanka too, obviously, the simmering civil war and Tamil terrorism, et cetera. Is that used also in Sri Lanka? Well, um, I mean, as I said, on newspaper, of course, uh, hate speech would not be tolerated any kind of hate. There's plenty of it happening in social media. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to ban, but as an editor with a newspaper, you, do, you don't allow it. It's not printed. So, mm -hmm. so yes, but um, so there is that curtailment. But I agree a lot with what Ian said about free speech and um, it, it's expressing, being able to express exactly what you feel. Uh, I don't agree with hate speech, of course. 
and um, because it does lead to racism, and that should not be allowed. Yeah. So. Where is that limit? I mean, I see that there's there's some idea of sort of limiting speech from people on the panel. What is the what is the limit when you say, well, it can sort of provoke racism? Um, so what what do we do? We cut off speech that, and who decides what what is provocative and what could produce racism? I mean, is there a there is actually? I mean, the, uh, you believe that we should sort of cut speech off at some point? No, I think more. I think you know there has to be. I think legislation to stop newspapers telling lies about people. So there has to be some kind of repercussion if a newspaper can't just make, I can't make up a story about you and print it in the newspaper. Yeah. So there have to be some kind of limits on free speech somewhere. Uh, the thornier issue is how you deal with things like racism. I mean, in Britain, if a paper is racist, then it's gonna not sell any newspapers. So th there's a market limitation, yeah. which is far more powerful than a legal limitation. Yeah, um, I mean, as Fleming was saying in the US, as, as, I mean, these things, the speech codes on campuses, which are pretty onerous, um, they're not codified into law. I mean, there's obviously some of these are state-run universities, and, but, you know, you don't like it, don't go. And you're not gonna end up in jail for it. But I, I would say that you fight hate with arguments and words and not by uh, outlawing it. And, and uh, I, I wrote a book about this, and I, I spoke to um, a famous French intellectual, Marek Halter, who during the war was in the Warsaw Ghetto, and he went to Uzbekistan, um, um, was evacuated with his family, and uh, he went to the market uh, every night where young people were, um, they were shouting or throwing, um, you know, bad words at uh, one another, and uh, when um, when, when the counterparts didn't have anything more to say, um, uh, violence started. And then, he, and, and then, in fact, that story was the reason why he engaged himself in the peace process between uh, Israelis and uh, Palestinians, mm -hmm. based on the, on the notion that violence begins when words stop. And that's why you, do, you, you shouldn't outlaw words, but you should insist that you meet hate, hateful wor words with, uh, with arguments. And for instance, right now in, in, in Europe, where we have um, uh, a lot of uh, immigration from uh, the Middle East, Holocaust denial or skepticism about the Holocaust is a pretty widespread uh, concept. And, and if, you, if you outlaw that and you, are not, you're not, you do not have the right to air these uh, opinions in public, it's impossible to educate uh, people and tell them, you know, the real story about the Holocaust. You even have parents who ask to be free from um, uh, from history lessons when uh, teachers are telling about uh, the, the the history about the Holocaust. So I don't think that it serves any uh, society, uh, interest in society to, uh, to, to ban this, quite the opposite. And we have now these memory wars in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, and the, and the logical consequence is the law passed by the, uh, the Russian parliament. And in Latvia, a week later, they passed a law um, uh, banning, denying the fact that Latvia was occupied by the Nazi, Nazi Germany and, and the Soviet Russia until 1991. And, and so it goes. Mm -hmm. If you, uh, if you uh, push through your taboo, I will push through mine. But how do you deal with the fact, I mean, in Western studies also, we have Islamophobia on the rise, and uh, you see it in pretty much all the Western countries where there's a growing intolerance uh, and almost bigotry towards Islam, and uh, ever there's an impression given in a lot of places that anyone who adheres to the faith of Islam is a member of ISIS. Now, the people who are being subjected to that sort of Islamophobia are people who are generally powerless, mm -hmm. and they don't have the tools to fight back. They don't own newspapers or television stations or radio stations. So how do you try and get some kind of equity there? Education, and you have to give them a platform. But that's a and, 20, 30, and, 40 and, year and, process. And for, for us as a press, I mean, we, we, I think we, uh, um, we make the mistake that we tend to uh, present imams from all kinds of mosques that may you know, promote these views as representatives of communities. So we have to get sources out in the community and let, uh, let people speak for themselves. Um, uh, I mean, it's a question of stereotype. It's, it, it's not only about uh, Muslims, it's, it's about stereotyping 
in, uh, in, uh, in, in general, and we have all been criticizing uh, Putin's Russia here, but, um, uh, and, and this in a certain way has also led to what we could call Russophobia, that, that we tend to, to perceive uh, Russia as representative of all Russians, um, uh, even though it's, it's uh, you know, a certain man and the people around him who, who runs the country. I think you also, you also do, have a tendency. They do not govern in his name. You have a tendency, if you shut this kind of debate down, to have a negative backlash. I mean, we see in Sweden recently, uh, the Sweden Democrats, Fair Democrats, and I have 13% of the vote. It's almost double from what they had last time. And you have a media in Sweden that really, really is is the kind of silent things that one doesn't talk about these issues. And you have people be, you know, being tossed into jail for stupid bits of, uh, of art. And then all of a sudden, people blink and they say, God, what happened? open, tolerant Sweden, 13% of the country voted for a party whose roots are in neo-Nazism. The, the beginnings of that party was a fascist party, and now it's, you know, the third most popular party in the country. And I think there's also tends to be a boomerang effect if you, if you limit speech. It doesn't have, like, well, we just keep it there and it'll go away. So, maybe, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, no, <laughs> we'll see. No, um, but I think what Ian is talking about, I mean, it, it you... I mean, it's an open, open question, but it Im implies some kind of social engineering. I mean, how do you get a... No, no, I don't uh, think social uh, engineering. I just think we have to accept that there is an inequality in, in obtaining access to the public debate and to the media, and you have to recognize that. Yeah, but if you talk it's, about, it's, it's, Ian, just to get, just clarify, but you talk about religion, and this is obviously a, a very hot topic in, in, in Europe now. It, it's been in America for some time. In 1999, the mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, was protesting a public museum, having an artwork that was offensive to Catholicism. Um, this thing is always simmering. It's always there. Um, and you say, well, you know, there's the rise of Islamophobia. Um, what does one do about that in a sort of legal way? I mean, is that, you know, because we're, we're talking about legal limits on speech, and we're talking about sort of, I mean, there's no legal limit on what Fleming did, but there was threats to him and threats to him every day still. No, I'd never advocate a legal solution to something like that. I think really the most powerful dynamic is social change and yeah. unacceptability of this sort of, but it, I think you also have to recognize the imbalance in, 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 in terms of the access to the voices. Mm -hmm. um, and it's finding a way to work through that and to empower people who don't have the voice uh, at the same time as trying to fight the, the stereotyping. Mm -hmm. And I think, and you know, you do, you raise Putin in Russia and I think it's very important to see that Putin is not Russia. And the tragedy to me of Putin is that, you know, I love Russia and I love the Russian people and Putin is such a cancer on the top of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, let me bring you in here. You've, you focus on three countries in your book, China, Russia, and Cuba. We haven't talked much about Cuba. We have Yoni Sanchez here, um, who's a tremendously brave uh, person. You know, you have an American like Alan Gross who goes down to Cuba handing out internet dongles and ends up in prison for God knows how many years now, six years or something. When, when you were writing about Cuba, what is, I have this, this deep frustration with American media. It always says there's, an, there's always an opening. Things are getting a little more liberal in Cuba. Economy is opening up. Media is opening up. Yoni Sanchez is not in jail. Um, well, yes, but it's a one-party state with one newspaper and various types of that newspaper. I mean, what was the impression that you got of, the, of what speech is like now in C Cuba? I mean, you get the sense that it's slightly more robust, which I don't believe. Well, internet penetration in Cuba is stunningly low, at least compared to China, and one of the biggest barriers is access. Most Cubans don't have internet access at home, and then if they want to use the internet, they have to go to a hotel where it's really expensive, or they go to an embassy. So there's And there's restrictions on that, too. Yeah. I mean, it's not easy to use the internet yeah. in, in Cuba. Um, there is still, you know, relatively small but very vibrant group of bloggers who are expressing themselves quite freely online. Um, I think the dilemma for Cuba is going to be the dilemma that was faced by China many years ago, which is that there's a lot of rhetoric in Cuba about modernization and reform. And it's pretty hard to have modernization and reform without the internet. So they're going to face like the quintessential dilemma, which is that we want to modernize this place, but we 
also want to keep the inter internet under control. And I would imagine that Cuba will probably look toward China and toward the Chinese model as kind of a successful example yeah. of how to do that. But as we've also seen in China, the government can't completely control the flow of information. Yeah. So that's probably the most optimistic aspect in Cuba is that they're going to want to modernize things, let in more internet access, and they'll try to control the internet, but probably won't entirely succeed. But these bloggers in Cuba, I mean, they're not, they're not winding up in jail. I mean, some of them are, right? And what is, what is this sort of ideology behind that of allowing Yoni Sanchez to have a little bit of freedom, not access to the internet, nobody else really has access mm. to the internet, but she can sort of drip things out to, to mostly people that don't live in Cuba. Well, I think Yuani, I think you're speaking today, can probably answer that yeah. <laughs> better than I can. But um, I think probably Cuba, like a lot of governments, probably underestimates the power of the web. And because bloggers are relatively few, and because they are speaking, right now they're speaking more to the outside world than they are domestically because internet access is so low. But we shouldn't underestimate the power of that. I mean, you look at Yuani, for example, she has over 600,000 followers on Twitter. She has a real international presence. And even for the lesser known Cuban bloggers, to a certain degree, their international audience affords them a little bit of protection because it was more dangerous to be anonymous. It used to be very easy to just make a Cuban troublemaker disappear. And now, you know, if, a, if someone is arrested, they kind of have a little bit of protection in the fact that the world will know about it potentially in real time. But to answer your question, I would say that probably the Cuban government figures that there's not that many bloggers right now. They're not really stirring up domestic unrest, so they're not enough of a problem to put them all in jail. Yeah. And the, we're running out of time. The final thing I want to talk about is, is the threat of violence as a reaction to speech. And two people in the end could probably speak to this. Um, no, but I would you know, just, you're no uh, longer a journalist. I mean, no. you've, 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 I mean in, in some sense, and I hate to say this, I mean, you said you love your new job and you're, you're in school. In, you had to leave your country. Yeah. You're no longer a journalist. In yeah. some sense, you know, violence wins, doesn't it? I mean, oh, you, yeah. Absolutely. Um, in, in, like I said, in Sri Lanka, certainly it does. Um, too many journalists have paid the ultimate price. And like me, dozens have fled the country, been forced to flee. Uh, yeah. And they all live in exile. So yes, so mm. it, it has won. I mean, for a long time, for over 20 years, I stood firm. I was determined to not let it win um, or to get the better of me. But ultimately, yeah, it yeah. did. Uh, journalism was my passion, it still is. I do still write a column for the Seattle Globalist, uh, but that's it. Yeah. Those, my journalistic days are <laughs> definitely <laughs> over. <laughs> and uh, Fleming, and we, you and I have discussed this in, in, in the past, is you know, there has to be a certain success of a, of a campaign against you, because people at your newspaper, I mean, there's a point where they said, you know, we're all in danger here too because mm -hmm. of what you're doing. Can you kind of not talk about this as much anymore? Can you not kind of publish the cartoons? Because in that no, sense... No, no cartoons being published in Denmark uh, anymore um, of that kind. And, and uh, what, Wait, what, 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 I, what I would, what I would uh, ask for, you know, what, what is going on in the Western world when it comes to this issue is that we tend to rationalize our fear. And this is also what people do in a dictatorship. When somebody says something that causes a violent reaction, um, we very often blame the messenger and say, well, you shouldn't have said that. I mean, couldn't you have uh, figured out that uh, you know, this kind of reaction would have followed? Um, and uh, for instance, in, in, in Denmark, editors when they say you don't publish these cartoons anymore because we know how they look. And I say, well, we also know, la know how Barack Obama look. Mm. And uh, every time he, he gives a speech, we have a picture of him. Um, so, so I would very much argue for the point of view that the people who commit violence, it's not an automatic reaction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's people with a mind uh, that 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 uh, makes a decision to commit violence. They are not, you know, animals. Uh, uh, they are human beings who can make individual decisions uh, about a certain way to react uh, to the events that are going around uh, yeah. around the world. So we, if we if we follow this logic that 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 violent reactions are some kind of automatic reaction, I think it's very discriminating against uh, those people because they are human beings as everybody else and they make their own decisions. 
Uh, we are out of time. I want to say actually on one to Fleming's story and one positive note. There actually is a positive note at the end of this. One of the imams, uh, self-proclaimed imams, who went to the Middle East to whip up um, anger and violence and uh, uh, named Ahmed Akari, uh, Danish uh, imam, has flipped, has apologized, has apologized to you, I believe, mm. has apologized to Kurt Vestergaard, the cartoonist, and um, it was a, a wonderful tiny little moment of the triumph of liberalism in a illiberal situation with a lot of illiberal voices. So that was the one positive thing that I, I saw recently to come out of uh, the so-called cartoon crisis. Thank all of you, I thank all of you, and we're gonna go eat now and uh, 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 we'll talk later. Most important. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.